Good morning, Southside. I'd like to give a special greeting if anyone is here visiting with us. We're always grateful to have anyone who comes and worships our God with us. Uh, we had a ladies' retreat this weekend in a trench and just got a good report about all that God did through that time together. So rejoicing with you ladies and pray the fruit will keep growing in your hearts over the days ahead. We had the first day of Southside Classical Academy here on Thursday and God just really blessed and some beautiful things that he's doing and loving those little kids. Uh, This morning we're going to go back to our study in Philippians. So if you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 while you're doing that, I need my pad. Philippians chapter 3, we started this last week, and what a gift this chapter is to the church as Paul is laying out his personal testimony, and he's sharing us what did the gospel do to Paul, and what what caused, what did it cause in his own heart, and what should it cause in ours? And there's some rich truths that we'll take up again today, and we're just going to keep turning it over to look at it from every angle. So if you'll look with me in Philippians 3. Verse 1, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me, and it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, and beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I've counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Let's go to our Lord. Father, these are rich words, and I thank you that you have had Paul pen these things by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God so that what we hold is inerrant, it's truth, it's God-breathed, and it is useful for correction and rebuke and training in righteousness and revealing to us the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I pray this morning, Father, that you would just open every eye and heart to what is before us. Don't let religion get in the way of Christ. Don't let 20 years of being a deacon or elder or serving in a church keep someone from Jesus this morning. Father, I pray that you pull back the veil of self-righteousness and you let us look right into the face of Jesus Christ in this glorious gospel. So God, come do more than we could hope, think, or ask this morning. By the power of your Holy Spirit, through these words, may you be glorified. Amen. Well, last week in Philippians 3, 1 through 3, we saw this was a call to joy. Rejoice in the Lord. And we saw that there are hindrances to our joy, and it's this legalism, it's this false teaching of the way that we get right with God is Jesus plus something. And then we looked at what were the helps to our joy. And he says in verse three, we're the true circumcision. We've been circumcised in heart. And we're now those who worship in the spirit of God. We now worship from the heart, from the truth and the light that has broken in and the glory of Christ. We worship not with external means, but from the internal now because of this gospel. And we glory in Christ Jesus alone. We, we look to him. We believe in him. We, we know he, there's nothing else that will ever make me right or bring me to glory but Jesus Christ. So Christ plus nothing equals everything. And we're those who put no confidence in the flesh. And so I want you to hear this clearly. Joy will always be elusive until it's anchored in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It will always be getting away from you if it's based on your performance, how you're doing. You're going to never be able to hold this, uh, that righteousness has been put to your account by faith and not by your own works of the flesh. 
Performance for God's forgiveness in relationship is a death blow to joy, and I've experienced it in my own life, and I've shepherded it. It will kill you, and it will cause you to die. This morning, Paul's going to address then the antagonist to this point. And as he does, if it's any antagonism in our heart, I pray that what comes will we'll just kill it and bring surrender and faith. The stumbling block that the Jews had with the new covenant as the gospel of Jesus Christ was being preached, how was the law for righteousness keeping them from Christ's righteousness? And the argument is this, Paul, you're, you're throwing out all of redemptive history, Like there's been thousands of years of God dealing with Israel and it seems like you're chucking it. God's been dealing with us. He chose us. We're his nation. He's working out the plan of salvation through our people. We've been given, we've been given so much over the years. We've had God's presence, his protection, his promised land. He brought us out of slavery. The law of Moses, he gave us. We were given the the two tablets of stone. We were given the prophets, the tabernacle and the temple. These things are essential to righteousness, Paul. You you can't get righteousness without God's standards, his ways, his laws, his ceremonies, his sacrifices. You, You must have fallen off that horse on the road to Damascus and hit your head really hard, Paul. How do you say these things? This is big. Because this is how the natural mind will always think about getting right with God. Since Adam fell, the natural man will always look to his or her own hands to try to get right with their God. Man has tried every way back to God through his righteousness, thus world religions. And at this point, (coughs) by way of introduction to make sure we don't miss this, I just want to keep going deeper. I've been praying all week is I want your joy. This is where you're going to find joy is to make sure these things are not getting you. And I've studied this before and I walked away with, of course, you don't get right with God by keeping the Mosaic law. And I missed how much of this own garbage is in my own heart and trying to merit God's acceptance. It will hide under a lot of things because of remaining sin. You're going to have these these ways that you don't even realize you're trying to do this. A gentleman who mentored me through his preaching for decades fleshed this out as I was trying to study and understand this deeper. So I want to borrow from his thoughts because it helped me this week. The whole gospel, I think, hangs on this point. And really, your, your eternity and your growth in Christ So God, help us to not be wrong on this. You can be wrong about a lot of things, but not this. So God, will you meet us this morning? And I've been thinking about it by the way of a a resume. So what is a resume? A resume is kind of this little piece of paper or a little zip drive. I don't know what you use now. When I grew up, it was paper. It's a list of your accomplishments, your skills, your abilities, and your qualifications. And most of us spend our lives trying to hone this in and make it as strong as possible so that we can get into whatever it is we're trying to get into. I guess the purpose of a resume is to get you into something that you're on the outside of. So this resume might get me into what it is that I'm looking for. So if you're trying to go to college and you're in high school, you take all these classes that are advanced and you get a 4.3 4.3 grade average. I, I could only get a 4.0. What's, what's the deal? I, I heard these kids go, I got a 4.67. I'm like, that's crazy. How do you get higher than A pluses? And so you got all these AP classes. You hold this up to your college dream. And you hope that it's enough to get you into their college. Then you come to a job. And you list all the jobs that you've ever done and how well you performed at them, how vast your abilities are, and here's your hope, that some manager, owner, or CEO will look at it and say, your resume is going to get you in to this company. And then you move into friendships. You go off to school. (coughs) How do I fit in? Who's going to like me? Maybe my humor. Maybe for me, I was good at kickball, and it made me friends. Uh, You hope that they'll let you in, and you might have a friend. 
And then you move into this really dangerous area called romance. And now we really get insecure. And you say, man, I hope my resume will, will get me in. So how are you going to get in? Well, my appearance, my personality, my brains, I'm going to take you to a restaurant that I can't afford. I'm going to climb mountains. I'm going to do all these things. And I'm hoping that my resume will get me in. And even in thinking through this, we have resumes for ourselves is that I have to perform or be a certain person and I'll let myself in. We, we shut the door on us if we don't measure up. And some of you I've counseled so long that you've broken even your own standards and what you expected and you can't forgive yourself and your resume won't even let you in to yourself. You beat yourself up, you hate yourself, you live in regret the rest of your days. Uh, that's a resume that, that didn't let you in. And the bottom line is that we're all seeking righteousness. We're all trying to live up to something. And when you fail, you can't handle it. You don't want to live. You're undone. And when it doesn't get you in, you're wiped out usually the rest of your days. And I love this example that this pastor shared. He used the illustration of him and his wife. And he said if things went wrong at the church that he was a pastor, he was just undone. It would just throw him. And his wife would say, it's okay, honey. God has this and he's working for our good. He goes, and then something would go wrong with the kids and my wife was undone and I would say, it's okay, honey. God's working for our good. And, and he said, what was the difference? Well, what was our idol? What were you looking for for your acceptance to prove that you're okay and your resume uh, just got torn up? And so I, my resume was I want to be a good pastor and it's failing and I want to be a good mother and my kids are failing. And so you both got different idols and the resumes aren't working. <clears throat> so I want you to get this. Since the fall, we are naked and ashamed and we try to cover ourselves with our resumes, our own fig leaves. It's why everyone tries to be the king of their own kingdom. I never get tired of seeing that. Everybody finds something and they're the king of it. And we all want to prove ourselves and we want to show that we should have acceptance and, and like me because of my resume. But the point of the passage before us is that we all have a resume with God. We are all looking for a righteousness to live up to something, to get ourselves right with the creator of the universe. And Paul this morning is going to lay out his resume right before our own eyes. And this has been his whole life. Everything that this man has lived for and been passionate about, he's given himself to it. Like none of his contemporaries. Paul had a resume like no one else. And I don't think there's ever been one as polished or accomplished as Paul's. And for Paul, this in his mind is what opened the door for him to come into the presence of God. He was very proud of it. And this morning, we're going to see that something really amazing happened to Paul's resume. And today, we're going to stare in the face of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm asking you to come stare with me this morning. You've been prayed over that you would see this for sure. Verse 4, although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. And I want you to hear this. This isn't boasting. It's Paul for the sake of argument or maybe for the sake of conversion. Uh, he says, I want to show you the hall of flesh. I want you to come look. If anyone in this room thinks that you will be able to merit God's favor, Paul wants you to look at his resume and he blew you away. I was circumcised on the eighth day. The Ishmaelites were circumcised at age 13. If you were a proselyte into Judaism, you were circumcised when you were converted. But a true Jew was circumcised on the eighth day. And in Genesis 17, 12, God said, Every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house of who is brought with money from a foreigner or who is not your descendants. And so Paul starts out with, I'm an eight dayer. Just get this at this point. I want you to hear this ritual can't save you. If you were leaning on, I was baptized as an infant. I was confirmed. 
I took First Communion. That would tie in here as well. None of those things will ever make you right with God. The second thing Paul says on his resume is, I was of the nation of Israel. This was mine by birth. See, I'm not a proselyte. I'm the real McCoy. Romans 9.3, I could wish that I myself were accursed, Paul said, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren and my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenant and the giving of the law, the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. I'm of the nation of Israel. God said, Israel, you only have I known. I've I've known you, meaning I've loved you and I've set you apart for myself. And he says, I come from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Ishmael and Esau. I'm a pure descendant. I'm the real deal. And really these two things are what a Jew thought saved them, being circumcised and being a Jew. And Paul right away is saying, those are the things I had. I was circumcised eight day and I was a Hebrew of Hebrews of the nation of Israel. And Paul says, no, it's not enough that you're born into a Christian family with great privilege. And I want to make sure that none of you are resting on that. Your family can never bring you into a relationship with God. And he says, thirdly, on his resume, I'm the tribe of Benjamin. He came from a good clan. I'll never forget when I went to Ireland uh, I, I didn't realize it, but just the name Murphy, everyone I met, they, they just hugged me and wanted to talk. And they're like, that's the number one name here in Ireland. You know, and they're just wanting to buy you a Guinness. And you're like, no, thank you. And they just, you're their family. But I, as I'm looking at that, Paul's just saying, I'm from one of the two most elite tribes. Judah, where Christ would come from. And I'm from Benjamin, the youngest of the two sons born to Rachel. So this was Jacob's favorite wife. And he was the baby of that family. In fact, he was the only son who was born in the promised land. In Judges 5.14, Benjamin was on the front line whenever they would go into war. The first king, Saul, was chosen from this tribe. Paul was even named after the king. <clears throat> when the kingdom divided, Benjamin stayed loyal to Judah with the southern kingdom. Mordecai came from this tribe. And so Paul is saying, I come from a privileged class. Yet this cannot save me. A godly lineage for generations cannot bring you any closer to God. My grandpa was a pastor. Um, Those kind of arguments will never, ever get you closer to God. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a full-blooded Hebrew. He spoke Hebrew. He followed the customs. He he was unwavering, and all the Jews knew it. Paul had the best reputation. And I want you to get this. No loyalty... To ancestral worship can save you. To say this morning, I'm Catholic, I'm Lutheran, I'm Baptist, that will never get you into the kingdom of God. Paul is saying that that is worthless as a means of salvation. So there's Paul's pedigree. And now he's going to turn, okay, now let's look at my performance. As to the law, a Pharisee. At the time of Paul, there was no higher you could go in religion than being a Pharisee. This was a sect that took obedience to the law to the highest degree. They were called radicals. Jesus, you, you, the, the day of Jesus, they were drifting into liberalism. It had been 400 years since any prophecy. And this sect arose and they cried out, no deviation from the word of God. We're going to read it, study it, memorize it, and obey it. Many sitting in this room the same way. They believed their strict adherence to the law is what saved them or at least made them better than all the liberal drifters of their day. Sound familiar? They had to start making calls on certain issues to which was more holy, and they built up this incredible system of righteousness. And when Christ came on the scene, there were about 6,000 rules that they had come to define how to live the most highest godly standard you could possibly live. Paul was a part of this group. He came from a line of the Pharisees. Galatians 1.14, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. So I took religion to the highest possible level you could take it. I never missed church. You couldn't have been more moral. 
than the Apostle Paul. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, I did not rest in my privileges. I was a firebrand for the law of God. And I tried to stamp out the Nazareans. And, and I killed Christians and I persecuted them greatly. Uh, zeal to a Jew was the highest virtue of religion as it, as it really is today. If, if you're just a little bit zealous, they make you a youth pastor after a month and a, and a senior pastor after two weeks, a worship leader after two months. So Paul had zeal, and he said, I love God so much that I hate anything that offends him. And I'm a monotheist, one Lord. The Lord your God is one God. And now they're saying Jesus is Lord, kurios. And so he persecuted them, and he killed them because of his zeal for God. And today we say, hey, just choose your religion as long as you're sincere. And the problem is you're sin-seared. And God is not impressed with sincerity if it's wrong. And Paul was going to say, I had zeal, but I was dead wrong. I had zeal for what I called God, and I was wrong. I can't help but to think of the holiness club of George Whitfield and the Wesley brothers. They had given themselves to go preach the gospel all over the world, and they were seeking to be as holy as men could possibly be this side of glory, and then they all got saved. Is your zeal on your resume? You stand out very quickly from your day and age with just a little zeal, and Paul says it's manure. It's manure. Next on his resume, as to the righteousness which is in the law, I was found blameless. Here's a stainless man. You look at politics today, and they just have to turn over one stone, and they find a million things. And so Paul is saying, you could... Look, from every angle, there are no skeletons in my closet. As to the law, I was blameless. Outwardly, I lived according to the law of God. I had an external blamelessness, righteousness. And so what I say to you this morning is, what a resume, huh? Surely this will get Paul what he saw, the favorable presence of God. He has to smile at him and be pleased with a resume like that. He has to smile at him, for sure. That, that would get you into any seminary, any synagogue today. This is the resume of all resumes. I don't want you to miss that. And I want you to see the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning. Religion says, go build that resume so God will let you in. I hope my good deeds outweigh my bad. I serve in the church, I'm a missionary, I go all over the world to preach the gospel, and I even serve in the nursery at Southside Bible Church. I built that resume, my friends. That's what the fall has done, is we come in in nature's night, and we can't see this gospel. This is what sin does. It tries to build a resume to get in with God. And we all look to our hands which is our resume. And none of us believe that we have nothing to hand to God on the last day when he says, why should I let you into my kingdom? Well, here's my resume. And so something mighty has to happen to bring a human to verse 7. But whatever things were gained to me those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. How do you spend your whole life zealously serving God and others and obeying His law, giving yourself to the Scriptures, memorizing the whole Pentateuch, reading the Bible from cover to cover to cover, teaching it to other people, and with all your heart and soul, you seek to obey God and everything that He's ever commanded of you? How can you build a resume like that and be in the who's who's list of, in religious circles to be the example of righteousness that everyone in that day looked to, to have the best resume in the world, to have it be your identity? This is who I am. This is my boast. This is my confidence. This is my pride. Look what I've done. And so hold it up now with a whole new understanding and a whole new eyes to see and to look at your security 
your resume. Verse 1, we talked about safety. And your resume has been your safety your whole life of how I get God's favor. And now you look at it and say, whatever things were gained to me, I count it as loss. How could that ever happen? I've never seen this happen naturally in any life ever. No one builds a resume like this, and one day they look at everything and say, everything that I've ever done in my life is loss. Most of us couldn't even admit that. We'd die. Maybe some people have said, you know, I spent too much time on this and not enough time on that. I've heard that at funerals. Some priorities were out of order. But who looks at their whole life and everything that you passionately gave yourself to and say, this is manure is the Greek word. Everything I've ever done in my life is a big pile of manure, excrement, meant pig manure. Everything I've ever given myself to I thought it opened the door to God. Loss. My whole life is a dirty diaper. How does that happen? And I can tell you this. It wasn't you. You'll never break in to be able to see this. I've preached this for 20 years, and they smile every Sunday, and they've never come to see this. It's possible to be in church your whole life and never see this. You can't make yourself see this. You can hear stories about it forever and not see this. Paul was on his way to persecute the the church on Damascus Road. What happened? Jesus appeared. And he saw him in all of his glory. So anyone who names the name of Jesus, I'm going to kill. And all of a sudden, the glory of Christ shines on him on that road. And it blinded him because it was so brilliant. And when he saw the beauty of Christ and his blazing righteousness and holiness on that road, he realized something dreadful. The light revealed something. And all of his righteousness, his resume, was rubbish. It was manure. It's not sufficient to bring me to God. I'll never be able to stand in this presence blameless with great joy. My resume was only enough to damn me forever and ever and ever. It was only enough to prove that it was loss. I want you to hear that. It wasn't all your good works, all the things that you've done. It's not just neutral. It's loss. A little religion never hurt no one, you want to bet? It's damned many. And it said it led me away from God. It didn't get me closer, it led me away from Him. I'm looking at my resume, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and leading me away from God, not to Him. That's the opposite of the whole world's thought. My good works and pedigree and my performance lack the glory of God. When I saw the glory of God, I was done. Everything that I ever did came short of God's glory. It didn't turn God's heart to me one iota. It didn't give one favorable thought to me. It didn't give a smile. It did nothing but bring the wrath of God upon me to look at him and think I'm good enough to merit his favor by my good stuff. It turned his heart from me. It didn't remove wrath. It stored it up. To think that my own righteousness was sufficient to stand in the presence of the noonday sun is insanity. And I beg you this morning, you'll die. Don't die in your good stuff. This is what Jesus meant when he said, unless you are born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. This is a supernatural work of God. You'll never see this. You'll keep working at your resume till you die. And if God opens your eyes... You're going to realize the manure of your whole life. You have to have your eyes opened by God 
Your understanding has to be enlightened. Our minds have been blinded, it said, by the God of this world. And when God says, let there be light, you see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Let there be light. And Paul got it. And when the light shines in, suddenly everything you've ever done that you thought would merit God's favor is a pile of manure. You see a beauty in Christ that you could never saw before. Paul wanted to kill anyone who named that name. Now he wants to die for that name. You'll cry out, Philippians 3.8, more than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I've suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish that I might gain Christ. Everything changes when you're born again. And too many people sit in the church with their resumes still. As your pastor, I pray that every resume would be torn up this morning. And you would look only to Jesus Christ for a righteousness that he gives. And when he does this, you have a new accounting. You have a new accounting for righteousness. And I want you to hear this. You have a new resume. And you know whose resume is put in your hand? Jesus. I got a new resume, and this one gets me in. This one gets me into the presence of God, and I can never be kicked out again. I got the best resume there's ever been, and God treats me as if that resume is mine. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The old one, manure. Run as far from that resume as you can. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to the cross. And now you get a new resume called the righteousness of God. Look at Philippians 3.9. I just want to be found in him, Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, my resume, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness, the God kind of righteousness, which comes from God on the basis of faith. I just want that God kind of righteousness now put to my account instead of my manure. That's what the gospel does. This resume is what takes you from the outside. You are separated from God and alienated. And this new resume of Jesus brings you into the very presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You're brought right into the middle of the Trinity. You're outside the promises of God. You're banished from His presence. And this resume brings you in to bring you right into the presence of God. Wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ alone. Faultless to stand before his throne. Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground, all other resumes are sinking sand. So I pray this morning that you see why Christianity is not go from being irreligious to become religious. It's not going from living in sin and now trying to live the Ten Commandments. This is why people say, I tried Christianity and it didn't work, because that's not Christianity. It was just another form of self-righteousness to get accepted by God and have him do everything that you want. This is Christianity, a whole new accounting, a whole new identity, a whole new resume, Jesus Christ that boasts now and says, Christ alone, I glory in Christ and I put no confidence in the flesh. And I worship in the Spirit of God, and I am filled with joy, a joy that the world can't take. So repent of your sins this morning, and repent of your righteousness, of your resume, and look to Jesus Christ alone, and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of your own derived from the law. So as we close out, I want you to picture this. I want you to picture you got your own business and every check that you write for a year, every time you wrote it, you entered it as a debit in your cash account. So those who aren't accountants, sorry, I wish you were. It's a a beautiful part of the gospel. So every time you put, you wrote a check, when you deposit cash, you debit it. And when you pay cash, you credit it. And so every time you put it on the wrong side of your ledger, and you spend, you're running this business and you just keep writing checks and, and, or, and you're like, man, what, what am I doing? I'm, I'm entering it as if it's a debit. 
and and you've been living on all this cash and you're so happy, just smiling like, I got so much security, my bank account is just growing. And, And you love this money, it's your trust, it's your confidence. And then you get the call from the bank that says, hey, you owe a million dollars. You owe a million dollars. Wait, I, I have all this money. And you thought you did. You really believed it. Every time you were gaining money, you were losing it. And that's what Paul's saying. Every time I thought I was getting God's favor, I was losing it. So what was gained to me was in reality a loss. And you'd probably despair. How much more to come to that last day and stand before God Almighty with all of your religion, all of your church attendance, all of your Bible reading and all of your morals. You've read every parenting book and you've done everything. You find out you're bankrupt before God. Like Paul did on the road to Damascus. So the question this morning as we close Do we cast ourselves then on Christ alone or do you just keep holding to your resume? Will you rest on your manure or will you this morning rest on Christ alone for salvation? What was once worth killing for, Paul is now willing to die for, that I might gain Christ. And now, because of this gospel, I worship in the Spirit. This gospel has has made me from the inside now worship Christ. I glory in Him alone. Anything else that you're looking at this morning for your standing with God, I want you to flush. Just look this morning your eyes out at Jesus and glory in Him alone. And put no confidence in the flesh. The only acceptable sacrifice to God is a broken spirit and a contrite heart. O oh God, thou will not despise. Be done looking to your hands. And when you come to your deathbed, your only hope will be Jesus' blood and righteousness. Yours is never going to be enough to get you through judgment. I need you to tear up your resumes. The only thing that you can ever hope in is the work of Jesus Christ and his righteousness alone. So how's, you, how's your accounting this morning? Are you still trying to build a resume? And if you are, you're most likely prideful because you think you're better than everyone else. That's a good test. Just kind of look down on everyone else. I wish they were as good as me. Or you're anxious because you know you're not keeping it. I'm just, I'm not measuring up. I can't keep it. I can't keep it. And you're just living in anxiety day in and day out. And you won't have the joy that Philippians 3.1 is calling us to. And so I want to be a minister for your joy this morning. With that one phrase, lay your deadly doing down. Down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in Him and Him alone gloriously complete. Look your eyes out. Jesus Christ this morning. Let's pray. Father, I pray this room is filled with the glory of Christ. I pray that all of our doing, all of our works, all of our resumes, all of our heritage, all of our denominations, and godly heritage and parents, I pray that even the little children this morning would all look away from anything they could do good and look only to Jesus Christ. God, give us that gift. Let us see the kingdom of God even this morning. Let us look at Christ and believe. And let joy fill our hearts that our performance is not what gets our acceptance with you. It was the performance of Christ. And we stand in his performance this morning, blameless, with great joy. God, let the saints of God be filled with joy. And I pray for any unbelievers who have been trying to clean up, trying to fix their life, trying to to live to their own standards. God, I pray this morning that you would show them all that's manure and they would be done with trying to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. 
And that this morning they would look to Christ alone and believe that they would come with nothing in their hand, nothing, uh, even future promises. I'm going to change my life. I'm going to clean up. Let everyone in this room look only to Christ for his death on a cross, for our sins and his righteousness, for the, the resume that we need to come into your presence. God, thank you for Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen.